Dr. Banerjee is Professor of Medicine, and she's the Chief of the Division of Endocrinology here at Downstate. She um, received her um, MD from Temple University, but then went through the ranks um, here at uh, Downstate, um, being a medical student, a resident, a fellow, a junior faculty, a senior faculty, and now being the chief um, of the Division of Endocrinology. Um, she is a prolific researcher with um, um, over 100 publications, over 100 abstracts on various topics of diabetes. She is a strong supporter of what we are doing here with pancreas and islet transplantation. And it is my pleasure to introduce you to her as she is going to talk to us about the economic burden of diabetes mellitus. Dr. Banerjee. So good morning, everyone, and thank you for those remarks. And particularly, thank you for inviting me to give a talk at this wonderful symposium. And I hope I can do you justice on the topic of the economics of diabetes. So first, I'd like to ask, does anybody here have any have diabetes or have relatives with diabetes or know people with diabetes? Can we have a show of hands? Can you raise your hands up? OK, looks to me, uh, for the statisticians, that this must be 99% with a positive p-value. So diabetes is an important thing for absolutely everybody. So I have no disclosures. Some of the learning objectives, I'm glad I had that slide up because I can see we have a lot of students. Uh, the, one of them is the cost of diabetes, healthcare resources, the issue of financial burden, lost productivity. We'll get a little, deep, a little dive into the analysis of costs and then ask, is there a way forward out of this? So what is diabetes? It's an excessive blood sugar. There are a variety of ways of defining it. Uh, for example, uh, the fasting glucose of over 126, a random glucose of 200 or greater plus symptoms, an A1C of 6.5, and we can also do an oral glucose tolerance test. Uh, these excess blood sugars are complicated. Uh, uh, the problem with diabetes is not so much the sugar per se, but actually the complications that ensue. And the complications are varied. They can involve almost every single organ in the body, more than what's up here, from a an excess of stroke, um, cardiovascular disease and heart attacks, peripheral artery disease, those are the macrovascular problems, and then come the, micro, uh, angio the microvascular problems, including peripheral neuropathy, the renal diseases, diabetic foot problems, and then a myriad of eye problems, some of which end up in blindness. So... Um, this is essentially what the main problem is with diabetes. It's also a global problem. Uh, Dr. Grusner mentioned that we have a lot of people with diabetes in Brooklyn, probably a quarter million people, because it's about 10% of the population of 2.5 million. Um, it's a global problem, and there are um, about 425 million people in the world today with diabetes. The largest number currently uh, happens in uh, the Western Pacific and China. The next uh, greatest is in uh, uh, the Indian subcontinent, and then comes the United States and Europe. But everywhere, diabetes is increasing, and the question is it doesn't seem to be slowing down, regardless of our appreciation of um, uh, all the, about the problem and its mechanisms. And so the question really is, what is it that's causing the entire world to unite over this thing and double its pop its population of this particular disease. The prevalence of diabetes then by age and um, uh, age on this axis, uh, and you can see that it's rising. The pre-diabetes is tremendous. There's diagnosed diabetes and undiagnosed diabetes. And in here, there's an incredible number of individuals, roughly almost 40% of the patients have uh, diabetes in this middle-aged group. 100 million adults now have diabetes or pre-diabetes. More than 30 million adults have diabetes. And this constitutes 9 point, almost 10% of the adult population. It's the seventh leading cause of death. And every 21 seconds, just get this, another person is diagnosed with diabetes. And you can have an innumerable statistics like this. They go on and on. And the question is, what are we going to do about it? Who has diabetes? So the, the largest uh, percentage of individuals are in the... Um, uh, American Indian and Alaska Natives, 15% of this population has diabetes. These are the Pima Indians and Alaskans. Asians have also a very high rate, between 7 and 9%. This is South Asians who are from uh, uh, the subcontinent of India, as well as uh, East Asians. 
from China. Uh, African Americans have 12 to 13 percent. Hispanics are 12 to 11 percent. In some uh, African American populations, the prevalence goes up to 18 percent among the elderly. Uh, so this is not a trivial issue, and these are the, uh, this is a population that uh, that uh, that lives around our hospital. Whites, on the other hand, have about seven to eight percent prevalence of diabetes. So it's a major problem in this hospital and in this region. So uh, what does economics mean to a clinician and to a patient? And I had to figure this out once I was assigned the topic. And uh, so I'm going to give you a story about a patient of mine who's a 63-year-old overweight woman who has diabetes for 12 years with many complications. Most importantly, she couldn't see very well. Her blood sugars were too high for the surgeon to perform cataract surgery despite her taking four injections of insulin every day. Her A1Cs were never anywhere near goal. They were about 10 to 11 percent. We had tried, we had sent her to education, to dietitians. we had tried all sorts of medications. She was insured at Kings County, so she didn't have private public insurance where they charge you $2 per prescription. But since she took about eight different medicines, not uncommon for somebody on diabetes, with diabetes, it was $16 a visit, plus her costs of travel. So I sat down and asked, what should we do next? I asked the patient, because I've run out of ideas and also out of time. It turns out that she only took one injection of insulin a day because she didn't have any income, and she was too embarrassed to ask her daughter, who did have a job for money, so she could come to her visits and pay for her eight different kinds of medications. So this is a woman who was doing what many patients do, is they take their money that they have and they simply stretch it out to last for the month. They don't take their medicine or they take a much lower dose of medication. And so it's easy for us to prescribe. It's hard for the patient to actually carry out the instructions. Another case is, came from a National Public Radio, much more fancily presented. And this is about the insulin's high cost leading to lethal rationing. This is a case about a man by the name of Alec who needed insulin for his diabetes. And less than a month after he aged out of his mom's insurance, he was dead. His insulin pen was empty and at his side. He was a restaurant manager earning $35,000 a year, but he couldn't afford the insurance. And after considering the cost, he opted out of it. The insurance cost $500 a month, and there was a $7,000 deductible. So after $12,000, the insurance would start to pay in. So he figured he couldn't afford it. And if you take $35,000, you pay a third in taxes and subtract $12,000, you're left with $12,000 to live on. So the question really arose, is access to insulin a human right? The answer, of course, is unknown, and we're in the middle of a lot of turmoil about this. But this is an important issue. So we'll get to the, the macroscopic cost of, uh, of uh, diabetes. For the 24.7 million people who have it, the cost is 327 billion. 237 billion, or 73%, are direct costs, and 90 billion, or 27%, are lost productivity and other issues uh, in that regard. The excess, uh, there's 15 billion for insulin, there is uh, nine, uh, 15 billion for diabetes medicines and 71 billion for other meds for things like hypertension and complications of diabetes and 70, nearly 70 billion for hospitalizations for complications. So let's take a little bit more of a closer look at all this stuff. This will look like a very busy slide, but this is the healthcare resources attributed to or incurred by diabetes as a percent of the national utilization. You can see that um, we've divided things into healthcare resources such as institutional care, that's hospitalizations, nursing homes, inpatients, hospice, and outpatient care, physicians' offices, ER, hospital OPDs. So just instead of focusing on the details of the numbers, just focus on the blue arrows for one. Uh, in uh, terms of millions of units, the United States as a total uses 162 units of uh, hospital care. People with diabetes, use 40 of those units, and that works out to being about a quarter of all the units of hospitalizations are used by a person with diabetes. 13% of that is attributed directly to diabetes. But otherwise, it's a much greater number incurred by people with diabetes. The same thing is true for nursing home and resident facilities. 26% of the total US uh, uh, use of this particular uh, health resource is used by people who have diabetes. So moving down to this portion of it, the outpatient care aspect, 
Half of the costs incurred by people with diabetes are attributed directly to diabetes. So these are the overall costs of people with diabetes, and half of them are directly attributed to their diabetes. This is another slide that looks a little busy, uh, pr produced by the American Diabetes Association in 2017, and has to do with healthcare expenditures attributed directly to diabetes by diabetes status and type of service. What are the types of services? Institutional care, as we mentioned, outpatient care, and outpatient medications and supplies. This is the total cost in the United States in this particular analysis. This is $1.7 trillion, and one quarter of that is used by, incurred by people who have diabetes. So that's about 24%. And that's where we get the notion that one in four dollars, healthcare dollars, are spent by people with diabetes. The next little bit of statistic that's over here is this number of 230, how do I go back? $237,000, which is, turns out to be one in seven healthcare dollars uh, is spent in the directly attributable costs to diabetes. So that's actually a great deal. Much of this is down in here with the $15 billion for insulin, another for diabetes meds, and $71,000 for all the other meds. And these are in billions of dollars. This is not small change, and sometimes it's too much for us to actually envision what that must mean. Now, the nation's healthcare dollar is about $3.5 trillion, or seven, over $10,000 per person in 2017. So we've, in this analysis, only had $1.7 trillion, or half of that total amount. So what on earth is not accounted for? Things like administering government and private pensions, insurance programs, over-the-counter meds, investment in research, infrastructure, disease management and wellness, office visits for things like the dentist, the optometrist, and non-physician -provi non providers. There are a lot of unaccounted for expenses in that previous analysis. What are the big ones? We've just mentioned them. The big ones are um, 71 billion for prescriptions, drugs not for diabetes directly, 70 billion roughly for hospitalizations, 34 billion for insurance and diabetes medicines and supplies, and 30 billion more for office visits and other visits and other providers. Key drivers of these costs turn out to be, as you must, you can figure out, medications, hospitalizations, the complications that drive the hospitalizations, various demographic issues, some populations use more or less, and then again, the uh, sort of mystical thing called indirect costs. Just looked at in a little bit more colorful way is the same thing, uh, looking at hospitalizations and meds for complications, which use up much of the cost, uh, office visits, supplies, etc., the rest of them. What about by age? Who's using all this stuff? So if you take people over 65 and compare them with under 65, it turns out that the per capita, in, per cost per patient uh, is about 13,000 if you're over the age of 65, and about 6,675 if you're under that. And naturally, most of the cost of the people over 65 is borne by Medicare and government spending. But here's that $237,000 total divided up amongst the various age groups. Now, what about if you look at it by different demographics? The big thing here is, the, as I said, the over 65 group, you, the Medicare population uses about $13,000 a year. The rest of them are in the six and $7,000. There's a little blip in the under 18 year olds, and that is accounted for probably by the, uh, the existence of type one diabetes in this group. If you think of uh, the issues of um, sex, it's roughly, roughly equal, men and women. Um, if you look at race and ethnicity, there's a little blip, uh, a greater utilization by non-Hispanic blacks of about $10,470, perhaps accounted for by their increased use of emergency rooms and their increased use of hospital outpatient departments. Now, what are some of the complications that uh, people with diabetes have? Uh, this lists the, the main ones that all of you know, because I think the majority of you are third year students, is that correct? Yes, so this is largely for you. So, uh, and you all know that uh, neurological diseases are an important one, for example, strokes. And for the entire population with neurological diseases, 36% of them have diabetes. If you move on to peripheral vascular disease, of the population of people with peripheral vascular disease, 39% of them have diabetes. So we're very over, diabetes is very overrepresented in, some, in lots of these very important and life-changing diseases. 27% of cardiovascular disease, 
29% of renal disease, and I see that Dr. Sagi is here, and he can confirm that, if not more, and perhaps this is an underestimate. And of the general medical population that comes in, only 8% of them are attributed to by diabetes. So diabetes is disproportionately loaded with the complications uh, that uh, the disease creates. Now, per capita expenditure, we uh, have had a little thing about that with the, uh, the older people, but people who have uh, diabetes cost two, uh, spend 2.3 times as much as those people without diabetes. So with diabetes, the expenses are about 16,000. Without diabetes, it's 7,000, giving you a differential of about $9,000 that it costs more if you happen to have diabetes. Quite expensive. What about indirect costs? What are indirect costs anyway? I'm gonna skip this slide and go to this one, which has a little bit more granularity in it, but it's the same slide. What happens is if people are absent, and this accounts for the proportion of the indirect costs, which is 90 billion of 3.7. That's a low, low contributor. Reduced performance at work. People come to work, but since they don't feel well and they're sick, they don't just work very hard. Uh, so that's called uh, present reduced performance at work. Decreased productivity for those not in the, la the labor force is another small number, 2%. Uh, reduced labor force participation due to disability is about 42%. And early mortality, there are 277,000 deaths, for example, annually in 2017, accounted for 22% of all this, of uh, the costs. So a total of um, $89,900. And it's hard for us to imagine that when we see patients in terms of thinking in terms of billions of dollars for the population as a whole. But unless we have some sense about this, we're never going to be able to get a handle of it and actually do something about it. Now, the mortality costs, um, for example, uh, the percentage of deaths in the attributable to vari various diseases from somebody in diabetes, 54% of the cases don't have renal disease, uh, a third, 25%, 28% of the people have cerebrovascular disease, and 16% have cardiovascular disease. So, um, important things. What about trends in diabetes costs? Between 2012 and 2017, uh, there was an increase of uh, quite a few, from $261 billion to $327 billion, re reflecting a 25% increase in over five years, about 5% per year. Now, if you have to adjust for, uh, for example, for inflation, because you do, uh, you, what happens is you find that um, the uh, total direct costs went up 23%, and the indirect costs went up tw uh, 26 and 23%. But you can see there's a steady increase from 2007 to 2012 to 2017. If you then say, well, I want to know what um, the prevalence of diabetes also went up, so I'd like to be able to adjust for that as well. And when you adjust for that as well, the costs are going up, but they're going up at a slower rate. 14% for direct costs, which are in red, and 11% growth for indirect costs, which are in blue, giving you an average overall increase, which is inflation and prevalence adjusted, of about 13% rise. So the, price, the costs are actually going up. I'm going to skip this one. And just to mention that diabetes is um, very much of a social burden. Components that were omitted from the previous analysis include intangibles from pain and suffering, resources from care provided by non-paid caregivers, and the burden associated with undiagnosed diabetes. So I'll just give you one example of a case that, uh, that recently was here of a, a well-established physician who came in with an acute, with a almost near MI and required a cabbage. And uh, uh, on questioning him, when he first presented, his A1C is 10, so they called us, and he's a physician, works in a hospital, has plenty of access to all sorts of care. He said, yes, about a year ago, my A1C was about 7.2. So what'd you do about it? He says, nothing. I figured it would go away, and it wasn't me. So a year later, he has an MI. He's not very old. He's about 40 years old, and he hadn't done anything about it. So the burden is, so had he done something about it, he wouldn't, may not have required a cabbage. He may have been treated properly. And this is another burden associated with undiagnosed diabetes. Let me take a little dive into the medications. We mentioned all the costs of medications here, which create a, a, a burden for, this, for, the, uh, me, for medical care. What do the medicines actually cost? So in order to, to present this talk, I actually had to go to a website called GoodRx. Has anybody heard of that one? 
Yes, some of you have and some of you haven't, so you should all know about it because you have no idea otherwise how to get comparison pricing here. Okay, they give you some discounted prices because they get like manufacturer's discounts. They give you coupons, it's like green stamps when people were younger or maybe when I was young and people put it in a book and got a toaster for it, but it's a similar way of, pro of selling the medications. The cheapest ones are up here. Metformin is $7 a month, but extended release metformin is 320. A liquid one is 200. Glucotrol is a sulfonylurea for seven. So between these two, you can do pretty well. But there are other drugs. These are the newer ones, DPP-4 inhibitors, citagliptin, linagliptin, for $500. The SGLT2 inhibitors, these are the most recent saviors for everyone. These are interesting in that they turn the tap on and they let all the excess glucose out of you so you have wonderful blood sugars. And in fact, these are supposed to prevent kidney trouble from developing. There's very good evidence-based medicine about this. It prevent, decreases mortality, decreases morbidity, and they're very good things. But what are they? They're about four or $500 a month uh, if you don't have insurance or if you have the kind of insurance that Alec had. How about the GLP-1 receptor agonists? These are the injectables. They work through the incretin system. Victoza, which is a common one, costs $920 a month. Uh, or the extended release version of it is 760 and others are in the $700. This was just released last month, not inexpensive. Combination drugs range all the way from $500 to $2,000 a month. Uh, here are all the insulins. The insulins are very old, and uh, the average insulin price is about $500 a month for the ones we generally want to prescribe, which are the analog in, uh, insulins. These are the basal insulins, also very expensive. And finally, there's a very nice insulin which has a long half-life, patients like it, it's $600 a month. So getting medicines is a very difficult thing, it's very time consuming, you gotta be on the phone with the insurance company to get what you call prior authorization, which is the bane of everyone's existence. So I'm gonna recommend that you students, some of you go into the political business, some of you go into the economics business to change the way medicine is practiced. So who uses insulin? Uh, 7.4 million Americans use insulin, 20% of African Americans with diabetes, 14% of whites, and 17% Hispanics. And buried in this little economic analysis uh, is a difference of 6% more African Americans than whites use insulin, and that's because they have two different types of diabetes. Insulin-sensitive diabetes, where they don't make any insulin and they're a type two, and insulin-resistant diabetes, in which case they do make insulin, but they're very insulin resistant, and they're like all the other diabetes patients. But this insulin sensitive, unique fraction of patients requires insulin as adults. And finally, a quarter of diabetes patients who are below the poverty level actually require insulin. I'm going to skip this thing about skipping medicines because we heard about it and ask the question Bant, just to remind you a little historical vignette, you know, Banting and Best discovered insulin in 1921. And in 1923, they got the Nobel Prize for it. But in between, Banting sold the patent for insulin for a dollar to the University of Toronto for the benefit of people with diabetes. And they partnered with Eli Lilly to create a social good so that people who had diabetes would live better and be able to live longer. In 2001, insulin cost $21 a vial, and now it costs four to $600 a month for pen insulin and for vial insulin. So what happened is the American Diabetes Association finally got its act together and decided to go to Congress to testify for the Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee of the U.S. House of Representatives Committee on Energy and Commerce. Why is it costing so much? And why are patients being priced out of a life-saving drug? And what is the human impact of rising insulin prices? So a bunch of the bigwigs from the ADA went down to just to sort of present the human side, the human stories of what happens when you can't afford five or $600 a month uh, for your medications. So a couple of things about complications, and that is, which we might not think of, lower A1Cs are associated with lower costs of, lower healthcare costs. And I'm just gonna leave you with that because I know I don't have oodles of time to go into this slide. But if the better A1Cs are associated with better uh, economic costs for type one diabetes. And this is another data, classic bit of data from uh, the type one diabetes um, studies showing you that the lower your A1C, not only is it good for costs, but it's good for decreased progression of complications. And you would expect that. 
But on the other hand, there's a corollary. The lower A1C is also associated with a much higher rate of severe hypoglycemia. And you can imagine that severe hypoglycemia is not a good thing to have. Besides the patient being sick, requiring a lot of immediate, immediate care, uh, it's, if you have severe hypoglycemia, it's much more costly than if you have non-severe hypoglycemia. Type 2s seem to be a little bit more than type 1s, at least in the British system. So um, I'd like to sort of conclude uh, with a few uh, com summary comments. People with type 2 diabetes have a twofold higher cost of care and costs of diabetes, the cost of uh, their medical care. The expenses associated with diabetes versus no diabetes is a differential of $9,000 for a total of um, $16,000. There, and the overall cost is $327 billion, utilizing one in four healthcare dollars. Are there any solutions? There are many solutions, and I think this is, some of these are the only way to go. Prevent diabetes. You can do, decrease the multiple risk factors for complications. There's lots of evidence-based medicine for this, and they can all be uh, improved if you optimize glucoses. But it has to be sustained and maintained, which is the tough part. There are these new drugs that I mentioned that are quite expensive but they may be very beneficial in terms of decreasing chronic kidney disease, cardiovascular disease, and mortality. And the recent data suggests that perhaps they are not, this mechanism is not via glucose lowering, but via some other direct effect. Other solutions incre include increasing pancreatic beta cell function. How do you do that? One of them is to induce remissions by diet and weight loss, and in the primary care setting it is possible if you lose 15% of your body weight and you started out overweight, but that is almost an impossibly difficult thing to pull off and sustain, but they did it. You can use pharmacotherapy, and, uh, such as uh, lowering the blood sugar and uh, decreasing uh, glucose toxicity, and the beta cells might spring to life for a while, and we have done that quite successfully at Downstate, and you can have remissions lasting up to 15 years. Bariatric surgery is also well known to be doing thing good things, and then finally there's beta cell replacement and islet cell transplantation, which is the mission of this particular uh, morning session. And I'm going to leave you with a couple more slides. And the question is, how do people change? Because all the things that I just listed as options of things to do require important uh, behavioral changes for them to succeed. And all important human problems require behavioral change. So if you want to prevent wars, you want to have peace, you want to have income inequality removed, or have, and the whole issues with xenophobia that's going on all over the world, all of these require behavioral changes for us to succeed. Healthcare requires behavioral changes, uh, particularly. And change is difficult, and most people make irrational decisions about all kinds of things, about their income, their savings, what they want to do with their lives, and people need to be nudged along the road to success. And uh, I was never going to end this talk with this, but my, my reading about economics of diabetes led me to this guy who won the Nobel Prize. And one of the, and I'll show you that in a minute, but he discusses the human element of economics, because ec economics is very sterile. It was all those charts that kind of make you go to sleep immediately. And then they come up with some numbers and they say twofold, and somehow we're supposed to do something with that. But in fact, each individual is a planner and a doer. You know, we have multiple personalities. It's a very Indian concept, right? They have goddesses with 10 heads. What does that mean? It means they have many personalities inside. OK, each planner signs up. So here's the example. A planner signs up for the yearly gym membership. It expects you to go to the gym every day and get fit. Easy, you know? Planet, uh, planet Fitness, $10 a week, or $10 a month. But the doer inside of you doesn't really follow through. It says, repeatedly postpones the gym trip to when it's more convenient until the year is up. I'll do it next year again. Then the, the, there's the nudge theory, which is created by this economist. It says, nudging is where small stimuli are provided to influence people's behavior. Nudges work at an individual level, but they're also used by larger organizations such as healthcare and, and companies to move people along to do the right thing. Because, you know, we can't legislate people's behavior. We have, they have to want to do something. And this guy uh, is called, uh, his name was Richard Thaler. He got the Nobel Prize in 2017 for the evolution of behavioral economics. And his talk was about from cashews to nudges. And what he pointed out is that if you want to nudge people along to do the right thing, you have to do it forever. It doesn't happen to tell them once to do the right thing. They can't do it. You've got to do it forever. 
And the reason he got the Nobel Prize was not for healthcare, and we know healthcare works in this way to move people along, because if I have a research coordinator who calls the patient twice a week and says, hey, did you take your medicine and did you exercise, it'll happen. It doesn't happen in real life. People stop their medicines, they don't come back to the, their visits. So nudges are forever, and difficult things require you to be reminded of them and so that you can actually do it. So I think my time is up, isn't it? Yes? Okay. So thank you all for listening. And this is my story on economics. And thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Dr. Banerjee, for a truly enlightening uh, lecture. Um, you know, it's heartbreaking when you hear about uh, patients who die because they cannot afford buying insulin. It will be upon you, the residents and the medical students, to make this a better world for the next generation. It cannot be that people die in the richest country on the planet because they cannot afford buying insulin. It will be your duty to deliver on that because we, unfortunately, have failed. You have to be better than we are in that regard, and you have to do that over, I mean, your lifetime of uh, professional work. Um, one other a brief comment that I wanted to make when I was listening to Dr. Banerjee, um, we are a relatively small transplant center, um, at least currently. Um, there are many uh, larger transplant centers who, what I call, are liver-centric, primarily focusing on liver transplantation. What we want to become is really the premier center for transplantation of diabetic patients, for all the very reasons that Dr. Banerjee just had presented to us. And I think we will achieve that with uh, Dr. Salifu and his team of transplant nephrologists, Dr. Banerjee, and many others that are devoted to the treatment of diabetes here in Brooklyn at Downstate.